Good morning learners and welcome to today's module where we're looking at module 1.5 and it's computer management for the grade 11 syllabus. Right, so we're going to be touching on a few things we have looked at before, which are things like system requirements and the software installation. We're also going to be looking at managing files and dealing with some hardware failure. Please remember, as we move through the grade 11 syllabus, what's going to happen now is that a lot of the work is going to start to be moving into the the sort of scenario area. So taking the skills and the knowledge that you have and starting to apply it to different scenarios to see, well, can you take this and actually apply it to a real world situation? Okay, so let's look at system requirements. Now, the last time we touched on this, we looked at basically what your computer um, has to have or needs to have in order for the piece of software to run efficiently on it. Yeah, we have some specs of a particular PC. This one's running Windows 10 Pro. That's the particular version. They always build. Um, we've got our processor. We've got our RAM as well. So we've got everything we need over there. Then here we have, and I used this example in the previous um, module as well, uh, we looked at the system requirements for StarCraft and they gave us the required, and this is the minimum that your PC needs to have in order to actually run this program or this game. So these are the minimum specs that it needs. And then we have the recommended specs and we went through that um, already. But I just want to briefly go through it again. So remember now, our system requirements for hardware indicate the minimum computing requirements needed to run the software. We're not saying it needs to run efficiently or it's going to run well, but it's just going to run the software. Okay. The most common hardware system requirements are hard drive space, memory, and your processor or your processor speed. So those are the three most common factors. Um, this is a typical question that can come up as well in a test or exam. Other hardware requirements might include a minimum screen resolution, um, specialized hardware for specialized applications. So if we go back to StarCraft, you can see because this is a game, we're going to be dealing with graphics. This is why one of the specs is specific to the type of video card or graphics card that you actually have. All right. So that's our system requirements. And then they just mentioned further to us, please note hardware. You've got two values next to the specification. The lower one is going to be your minimum. The higher one is going to be your recommended, right? So if they've got RAM and they say four gigs and eight gigs, what they mean is the minimum is four gigs. The recommended is eight gigs. Hard disk space. Obviously here we're talking about the storage space needed to install the software only. So it's not saying or that doesn't mean that when they ask you to have two gigs of hard drive space, that you need it for the game to actually store information. No, no, no. That's the space needed for the game or the software application just to be installed. Nothing else. Okay. Then the software requirements, usually what operating system is needed to be able to run that. Now, if the hardware available exceeds the recommended requirements, which is what you should be looking at. I know we can't all look at that, but... That is where you should be. The software will run smoothly. Now, you can imagine in the area of gaming, of video editing, um, designing, you know, um, architectural drawings, things, things like that. You want to go beyond the recommended specs to ensure that the software works beautifully. Okay. Then they talk a little bit about software installation. Now, we have looked at briefly software installation. Um, we know that we can install software through online downloads with installers. Okay, so you've got websites of companies selling software, you pay for it, you download it, you install the file and you run the installer. You do this via the App Store as well. Many of you go and download apps, right? Um, some of them have online downloads without installers. So pay attention to this now. How do we install software? Online downloads with installers. Number two, online downloads without installers. So here we're talking about things like freeware, open source software. You can install software via physical media. So you might be installing via a USB uh, flash drive. 
maybe via a CD or DVD, anything like that. Okay, so those are the ways in which we can install software. Please just pay attention to that. Now, when you go through the installation process, you usually have to agree to a license agreement. You know, when you um, install and you're going next, 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 I agree. Yeah? You are <laughs> agreeing <laughs> to the license agreement as to how to use that piece of software or game. Sometimes you'll have to input a product key. Um, these days you activate things online a lot. Um, you'll then choose a folder of where the actual program is going to install. You might have multiple drives in your uh, machine. And then like we touched in a previous video, um, choosing the type of installation, whether it's a full installation or a custom installation. Now, with your custom, you might be installing other extras. Um, you might also need to check for updates. So I know, uh, I know with my boys in the case of certain games, uh, you go and install the game. So for example, let's, let's take Old Faithful Fortnite and you install that. And then you need to run an update on the installation as well. Okay, so a lot of them <laughs> do that. Um, like I said, some you have to register online. There's shortcuts that have to be added. And usually when you open up a new piece of software, uh, they want to take you through a tour of the program to make sure that you've seen certain things and you know where various things are. On the uninstall side, and when we talk about uninstalling, we're not talking about, and please get this right, we're not talking about deleting the program off your desktop because it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. You went through a process to install the software. Therefore, there must be a process to uninstall or remove the software from your PC. Deleting the shortcut on your desktop does not do it. So, if I go to my desktop and there's a shortcut over there for Snaplify, if I delete that, that does not delete the program. That just deletes the shortcut. You are going to have to go into your control panel. Right? You're going to have to go into that. Go over here and you're going to look for programs and features. Sometimes it's just called programs. You're going to click on that. Let me just open it here for you. So you can see it. Programs and features. And then I've got the list of programs. And here you can see uninstall or change a program. So I will select a particular program. Can you see uninstall just came up? And I'm going to click on uninstall. Okay. This is how I can then uninstall um, any particular program that I have. But you're going to go through a process to do so. So if they ask you how do you uninstall a program, well, we go to control panel, we go to programs and features or just programs depending on the version of Windows you have, and then we go through the process of removing it from our computer, all its files. Speaking of files, we look now at managing files and particularly finding files in Windows. Now, we know if we open up our file explorer, generally this is what we have in front of us. And if I just maximize that, you can see there's a search over there. I've got quick access over here as well. So we are limiting the places in which that must basically be searched. And so we can select a specific folder in the left pane to search only within that folder, right? So if I go over here and I click in documents, do you see over there? It's only going to check within documents and then I can search for something and that is not in documents. You see there? Search results in documents. Okay? So we won't find that there. We have other properties if we want to refine our search. And maybe let me just bring this back. Do you see up there? There's my search. I can refine my search as well. I'm just showing you this live here so you can see that it's not just a picture. Um, but this is actually how it's done. We can type in the file name or part of it as well. So if I know that the file starts with FE, you see there? I can go and have a look for that. Maybe I'm actually looking for a document and I know what it ends with. Then I use my little star and I say, for example, .doc. That means it will look for any file that has a file extension .doc. The little while character there indicates that I don't know what the name of the file is. So anything that it's bringing up there. Okay. Right. 
And then we have our Windows Search. Windows Search facility lets you search for apps and computer settings in addition to documents and other types of files. This search over here, we all know this search. Um, it is still quicker and easier to use what I just used, the File Explorer, but that is another way um, that you can do it. Then other ways to manage files. You can tell what kind of data a file contains when you look at it. I mean, yeah, we can see this is a Microsoft PowerPoint presentation. We can see when it was last modified. We can see the size as well. So just be careful because some programs might not have um, or some files might not have a program associated with it because it might not have a program on that particular PC that can open it. Maybe you got it from somebody else. So you can convert it maybe to another file format or anything like that. Right, then converting files between different types. Now, this usually comes up in, in Prax as well. And please, when we do this, we're talking about saving the file as a different type. Why do we do this? So that we can share the data by using a common type that both programs can read. So there could be a different operating system. There could be a different version of Office, for example. Um, but you have these features that you can use to manage your files. Then we deal with the file properties as well and the attributes, right? So when we talk about the properties, we're talking about the metadata, looking at who created the file how long they have worked on it, um, was a camera used, you know, etc. All, all of these different things. We can even hide our files when we talk about attributes, because there's our attributes. Um, we can prevent the contents from being changed by checking the read only, okay, uh, attributes. So this is how we can manage our files on our PC. And then the last one, is dealing with hardware failure. Now, when we talk about hardware failure, we're talking about the hardware, the physical items that stop working. Okay. Now, hmm, examples of using hardware incorrectly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if this is, <laughs> this is, for example, um, it's a completely different port to USB, and we just, we just force it in. You know, we just force it in. Uh, we we don't care. And what happens? Uh, it breaks, right? Forcing connectors into wrong slots. What about the spilling liquids on equipment? Hmm, ever done that? Yeah. What about not protecting against power surges and lightning strikes? Look at the damage that load shedding has done to equipment. What about dropping equipment? Whoa, how many of us are guilty of this? <laughs> yeah, guilty. Guilty as charged. And not ensuring proper cooling. Some people often ask, why are computer labs generally cold? Um, this is why. Because these PCs are electrical <laughs> have electrical components which generate heat. That heat needs to be dissipated. It needs to go, otherwise it will damage the PCs. Therefore, we need cool air that can be taken in and circulated and go out. All right. Then we always want to keep spares on hand. And this is why you'll find many um, schools or computer labs or so on often have spares uh, just in case anything happens. Um, you want to keep spares in case you have issues with a peripheral um, and it's sometimes something critical. Please, when it comes to a loss of data, you want to make sure you have a proper backup policy. So you're backing up to a flash drive, an external hard drive, to the cloud, wherever. And then speaking of which, do we remember what a peripheral is? A peripheral device connects to a computer system. So this is the computer system. These are the peripherals. They connect to the computer system and add functionality. So this is my computer system. Does it come with a mic? No, it doesn't. Does it add functionality? Yes. Does the speaker add functionality? Yes. The projector, the mouse, the printer? Yes, it does. Folks, there is your definition of what a peripheral is. And that's the end of our module on computer management.